Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS 12 Hours. This is your Monday Minutes. Um, I want to welcome you today to another episode. We're going to, of course, continue on with our quick study guide and talking about environmental emergencies and sort of getting a little bit deeper into the cold emergencies or cold exposures. So, of course, before I begin, I always like to talk about why this stuff is important, guys. It's not just important for things like your exam success, where this, of course, can include key elements that you might see on your EMS exam, but it's also great for things like when you're making your clinical decisions regarding what you're going to do for your patients, how you're going to transport them and treat them. It's also great for your documentation and also your interaction with other healthcare providers like doctors and nurses and how you present the information, how you present your patients, and how you document what you've done or did not do for your patient. So this is an all great reason why it's important to know this stuff, right? But when we talk specifically about environmental emergencies and cold emergencies, we're talking about the mild versus severe, right? Your core body temperature, the CBT, which mild would be greater than, than 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius, and a severe core body temperature where it's getting very cold would be below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And your patient might compensate for that, and you're going to have these presence of, you know, signs and symptoms of cold exposure, exposure but they're going to have more of a normal core body temp, where you've got the hypothermic type patients, these are the ones that stop shivering at around 90 degrees, and this is where you have to sort of start looking into more of what's going on with your patient, right? So some of the three primary causes you're going to see for cold emergencies, right? One of the big ones is that cold water immersion. This is that main cause, especially with boating accidents and with water less than 96, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? The end, you know, it's acute onset, right? The person's in the water. and they don't get rescued soon enough, the chances are kind of pretty low that they're going to survive that exposure, okay? And then your cold weather exposure. Not as acute, right? But this is that close second of what uh, in sort of occurrence of, of, of um, injuries and exposures for patients, right? But this is going to occur over minutes to hours, Okay, that that old person that ends up out in the out outside without a jacket, right? Um, people who get stranded out in in the woods someplace, and they don't have sufficient, um, you know, uh, equipment to keep them warm enough, right? So this is the type of thing that we're talking about. And then you get the urban sort of hypothermia. Okay, those are those patients that are debilitated. They're they're older, the intoxicated patients, those homeless patients that are out there all the time, okay, maybe even all three of that at once. They could be old, they could be intoxicated and debilitated, right? So they have that poor, poor sort of thermoregulation, especially when people are older, okay? And thinking about also even babies as well, right? They have a sort of a poor thermo, thermoregulation um, available to them, okay? And this is more chronic, the homeless people that are out there for days, months, weeks, years, right? It's more of a chronic onset of of that urban sort of hypothermia, okay? So it can be hours to days, okay? Um, so what are some of the signs and symptoms that you're going to see with this type of stuff? Well, you're going to have that diminished coordination, diminished psychomotor function, altered mentation, right? It can be confused, um you know, maybe even agitated with you, that cardiac irritability you hear about, right? Patients that go into AFib or VFib or VTAC, right? Um, sometimes they'll be in AFib, they'll braid you down, okay? And the VFib is more common during that rewarming phase. That's why I tell you a lot of times to rewarm patients slowly, okay? And of course, I'm sure you've heard that, that, that old phrase of, they're not dead until they're warm and dead, right? That's specifically true, of course, with those drowning victims, with the patients that are exposed to cold water. You want to make sure they're warm first. Their body temperature, that core body temp, has to be at a certain point before you can actually consider them, you know, actually dead, right? So that's a lot of times why we work those patients up when we find them, even though they might obviously be dead, but because they've been in cold water, you want to go ahead and warm that body first before you actually make that decision, okay? Now, some of the treatment 
pretty common sense here, right? You want to follow your, follow your local guidelines, of course, guys, but I've always found that a lot of the treatment we give in the field as, as paramedics and EMTs and stuff, a lot of it's common sense, right? You want to get them out of the cold. You want to dry them off. You want to provide barriers. You give them blankets. You want to insulate them, right? But again, remember the handling, handling them gently, right? Checking that pulse for 30 seconds or even 45 seconds, okay? Um, do CPR as, as needed, right? Don't forget that whole cold heart, the warm and dead type thing, right? You want to go ahead and start CPR with them, okay? Um, you know, there's that also that idea, too, that when a person is cold now that cold heart they're going to be more resistant to being defibrillated okay just some stuff to think about when you're talking about treating these types of patients okay um of course oxygen warm iv fluids if you can okay um these are the things again a lot of stuff is common sense right a lot of stuff is we're already doing follow your local guidelines you might have specific treatment within your guidelines that might be a little bit different than this you might be able to do a little bit more maybe even or do a little bit less okay um dress and care for us by don't allow extremities and hands and feet and stuff to refreeze don't let the patient refreeze okay and hot packs okay hot packs in those key areas right um the carotids the head the lateral thorax the groin Okay, and try to warm the core first, okay? Um, not necessarily the extremities. Try to warm the patient's core first, okay? Because um, you do the extremities, you can have sort of that, that acidotic blood going on in the extremities that will end up washing into the patient, right? So you don't want to get that waste out into the core of the patient. So start with the core first and then warm the extremities um, afterwards. One final thing I want to mention um, in today's uh, Monday Minutes is just to focus a little bit on the localized freedom. We talked about the frostbite we just talked about, right? Just to kind of narrow it down, this is really more common what we see um, in the field. A lot of times is patients who have frostbite of their hands or their feet, their nose, their ears, things like that, right? So just to kind of just kind of focus a little bit on the localized freezing here before we end up today. Now, frostbite is that formation of those ice crystals in the extremities, okay? Um, trench foot, which is a form of, of frostbite. It's more, it, it's in the feet, which, as the tile suggests. And this is from things like the patients wearing wet socks for a long period of time inside their boots, and they still get their frostbite going on inside the boot, they don't even know it, right? So the frostbite is building up there. But again, sort of the same thing as that formation of the crystals in the extremities. And the treatment for this, we've kind of already mentioned this, right? You want to go ahead, um, raise up core body temp before those extremities, right? And you want to protect those sites, handle gently. You might see blisters. Don't break those blisters, okay? Don't let the patient smoke. Don't let them rub the extremities, okay? And again, don't let that stuff refreeze. Okay, so a lot of the, a lot of it again is common sense um, treatment for these patients. Um, but follow your local guidelines so you you follow what's what's appropriate for your agency before your um, your your county or where it is that you work. Okay, but again, a lot of this is is common sense. But sometimes your guidelines might let you do more or less depending upon what you have. Sometimes you can use coat warm fluid. Sometimes you can use warm ringers, ringers, lactate, things like that. Okay, so just some stuff to think about, guys. Again, this is key stuff, and this is why this is important for us to know because we can build upon this as we treat our patients and as we go on in our uh, assessment with our patients, right? So we can have this key information and be able to build upon it, okay? Um, guys, I hope you've enjoyed these Monday Minutes. I hope you can use these uh, in your day-to-day -day, day -day activities. Um, send me some suggestions, ideas for some future episodes. Uh, next time, we're going to continue on with some Monday Minutes, probably going to go into some drowning um, issues when we talk about environmental emergencies. Um, so send me the suggestions. My email is contact at emsofficehours.com. But leave me a comment. You can leave me feedback below as well. And give me a quick thumbs up if you're watching this on YouTube. Go over to YouTube, 
watch it there and give me a thumbs up with some comments there as well. All right, guys. Uh, also, be sure to follow me. Okay, check me out on Instagram. I am at EMS Safe at Instagram and on Facebook. It's Facebook.com forward slash the EMS Professional. So follow me on these those social media platforms. I have different things going on on each of those platforms. All right, guys. That's it for me. As always, I am Jim Hoffman for EMS Office Hours at the Monday Minutes. Stay safe.